Good evening, everyone. Happy 375th and welcome to Saturday. This is it. You probably know this is the exact 375th anniversary of today. So tonight, we will hear from some special guests, and then we will present Redding's speech. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge our host, the, re the residents at Pearl Street. When we first approached them, they, they were thrilled to do this. They said, we'll handle all the details, everything. It's been great working with us. So thank you very much. <laughs> and I'd like Nancy Lord to come up and speak. representing different segments and ages of the community. We have residents of this facility, and we have town and state officials, and we have this year's high school valedictorian. Most of you will recognize uh, a lot of them, maybe some of you won't. Some of these stories are going to be funny, some are poignant, some show direct connection with the very beginnings of the nation, and some are simply thoughts and opinions of the original writer from their time. I'll give you one example. I will start us off in a minute with the reading. Mine comes from a journal of a man fresh off the boat from England. He describes a hike he took out of Glynn to the Inland Plantation, what is today Reddick. He describes the things that he sees. Sometimes he gets it right, sometimes not. It's actually pretty funny, at least by 1600 standards. First, though, a uh, welcome, a fellow Reddingites, the chair of the Reading Select Board, Vanessa Alvarez. <coughs> City of Lynn before its incorporation as a town on June 10, 1644, 
And this year, the town will be celebrating its 375th anniversary on June 10, 2019. And whereas the citizens of Reading took an active part in the Revolutionary War by sending militiamen to Concord and Lexington, where they engaged the British troops in the first battle for American independence on April 19, 1776. And whereas 411 residents of the town of Reading served in the Civil War, including at the first battle of Bull Run in 1861, with a second company formed as part of the Grand Army of the Potomac and a third company joining General Banks' expedition in the state of Louisiana. And whereas in the 20th century, Reading became a growing residential community through industrial expansion that included General Tire and Rubber Company, Boston Stove Foundry, Ace Art, and several other major companies. And whereas the town of Reading today continues to grow with a population of approximately 25,000 residents and offers many notable attractions for visitors while still proudly preserving its rich historical character, therefore be it the result, I'm sorry, there's no more whereases. <laughs> the result that the Massachusetts House of Representatives and the Massachusetts Senate Join with the Reading community in celebrating the town's 375th anniversary. In further result, we'll copy of these resolutions be forwarded by the clerk, the House of Representatives, to the town of Reading, which we have with us here. Thank you. Uh, it is a uh, privilege to be here, and I have the uh, very good fortune of being able to speak in the 350th. Um, so I was very excited. Thank you. Thank you. Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Town of Reading. On behalf of the citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I am pleased to confer upon the Town of Reading this governor's citation in recognition of the 375th anniversary, this 10th day of June in the year 2019, cited by Charles D. Baker, Governor of the Commonwealth, and Karen Polito, Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth. Congratulations and happy birthday. Tail over his hind and then threw toward me a 
mighty rush, and it shed upon me a liquor of such stink that nothing but the opening of a bottomless pit can eat. My breath seemed stopped forever. When I recovered, the smell remained insomuch that they drove me from my house. <laughs> they would not abide while I remained. I still carry it with me to a terrible degree. I am persuaded that this is another device of Satan, a feast to his baptism by sprinkle. <laughs> That's from the Journal of Obadiah Turner, July 28, 1630.
Listen, my children, and you shall hear a tale about Fateful Night. On the 18th of April in 75, the Redcoats wanted a fight. Our hero, Martin Herrick, his studies nearly done. As word came down to Medford Town, the crisis had begun. Ride, Martin, ride, you've got to warn the countryside. Our differences with England have grown far too wide. It's hard to believe, young Herrick said, they finally lit the fuse. Duty calls, I must ride home to Reading with the news. My commander must be told, he thought, as he put away his books. With light and blue and familiar road, he raced to Captain Brooks. Ride, Martin, ride, you've got to warn the countryside. The regulars are coming, was the message that he cried. The midnight rider's silhouette was seen on Spot Pond shore. Hurry, poor gates were heard in Stony as the village clock struck four. The farmers and the tradesmen, all with muskets in their hand, rallied round to resist the crowd and march to take a stand. Ride, Martin, ride, we got to tell our side. Before this thing is over, our bombs will be untied. As Herrick rode into his hometown, his journey nearly through, the neighbors who responded had numbered quite a few. But upon arriving, he was told that Dr. Brooks was out, attending patient Hartshorn, a story some folks doubt. Uh, when Herrick found his captain, who sent riders east and west, who did he send to warn the end? Brooks sent out his best. Ride, Martin, ride. Ride, Martin, ride. You've got to warn the countryside. Martin, ride. Against the wishes of two thirds of the community, the state legislature votes articles of incorporation for the new town of South Reading.
Transportation, your committee, to prepare with your aid such an address. And you will now indulge me with your patient attention to an attempted history of the town. James Flint at the 200th anniversary of the town. separates, it becomes a separate town. April 4th, your committee is submitting its report to the inhabitants of the town. We cannot refrain from congratulating them on speedy and harmonious manner in which this next question has been settled and hope that wise Forces may prevail and prudent measures be accepted so that the best good and prosperity of all may be advanced. And the old town of Redden, having yielded one portion to the south and another to the north, may continue to receive the smile of Providence as she has had for the last 200 years. From Thaddeus Pratt, Caleb Wakefield, and Aaron Parker. <laughs> Emily Ruggles, a very successful local business owner and dealer in real estate, was not satisfied with her prominence in business. She applied to join the armed forces to be a part of the Civil War effort. She was denied because of her gender, so instead, she paid a representative recruit to join the military in her honor and her name. She was the only Massachusetts woman to do so, and possibly the only woman in the nation. May 29th, the 250th anniversary. During the week prior to the celebration, the decorators have been busy putting the public ways, common, and buildings, both public and private, in gala attire. The decorations upon the town building and engine house make a pretty picture when viewed from Main Street. On the Pleasant Street side, a large oil painting of Washington <coughs> crossing the Delaware, under the facsimile of the town seal. The decorations of the old bank building are most elaborate. Over the entrance of the public library is a large box of purple velvet with the motto 250 anniversary, 1644 to 1894. Walter S. Parker, committee president. Governor's address, May 29th. I am delighted to be here, and all the more so because I am here to come under what your chairman has termed unfavorable auspices. I have not missed the right royal welcome, which he said I would have received under sunny skies. I think the right royal welcome has been present here today, and it is the kind of welcome and it is the kind of work we look for in a community like this. In a newer community, we might expect something of changeability and of weakness something of shrinking from the elements. But your forefathers wintered in the storm, and whose grand virtues came out of a more rugged and prominent form, because they had the tutoring of the wind and the rain and the storm. Therefore, I am glad to testify to the sincere warmth with which the Commonwealth brings its assurances of the profound interest it takes in occasions like this. This is not a Commonwealth ruled only in the days of sunshine. We do not run entirely on kind of seas. It is the storm, it is the opposition, it is the difficulty and emergency we are called to be. Proclamation was made by Governor Allen, praising the town's core centeredness 
and a great number of citizens, particularly the younger generation, turned out to work. Christian Science Monitor, April 22nd, 1905. Ready to purchase its 300th birthday in a long tradition of courage, fortitude, ingenuity, and cooperation. These characteristics still prevail. While there are some who grumble and write because of the various restrictions, the overwhelming majority accept them with a spirit of willingness to sacrifice for the common good. The grumbles and writes are but the signs of a healthy, democratic heritage still intact. Edward A. Parker, chairman of the Food This is address is from President Franklin D. Roosevelt. I'm sorry I can't quite mimic his voice. Some of you probably recall when he sat behind the desk and gave many talks to the country. But this is 1944. It's addressed to the Honorable Lord of Selectman of Reading, Massachusetts. My hearty greetings to you and to all the community on the 300th anniversary of the incorporation of the town of Reading. These celebrations of local anniversaries can serve a high purpose in our community and national life. They carry our minds backward to our very beginnings. In those faraway days of 1644, we're planted and carefully nurtured the seeds of local self-government, a system to which our New England communities have clung steadfastly in all succeeding generations. That ideal still finds exemplification in the old-fashioned New England town meeting which, in principle, has spread far more from its place of origin to the benefit of every part of our far-flung republic. My message to the citizens of Reading today is to hold fast to the heritage of liberty, which is theirs, and of the faith and vision of the founders. President Roosevelt. Even then, 
there were many such in the town, were both white and neatly clipped. A slight smell of stable wafted from the sand water here was still acceptable both to the Lord and us. We were still in the Yankee country town, surrounded by hills and farms and woods and long sun-drenched meadows. Of course, we had our public schools. Was not the public school system the gift of the Puritans to America and the backbone of our democracy? We were told so often enough. The town had a high school housed in an incredibly ugly two-story brain building at the head of the common, in sad contrast to a beautiful white meeting house beside us in the best style of early home. I have just heard that the town is to erect a new high school costing $1,400,000. It will no doubt have a gymnasium, a basketball team, a football team, a band, possibly an orchestra, laboratories, vocational courses, college preparatory courses. It is erected not in the center of the town, however, but in the center of British Meadow, and for that I mourn. For it means the very end and extinction of what was in my boyhood worth more than all the schools in town, and gave us much beside which no school can ever give. British Meadow was unique. It was a flat space, nearly surrounded by pine woods, with there and there patches of birch trees white against the green pines. Through it wanted a small pool, and at the far end was a dam. Below this dam was a small sawmill. Birch meadow existed to be flooded in fall and winter, and emptied in spring to run the mill and saw up the winter's cut of timber from surrounding farmland lots. Its purpose was purely utilitarian. Its actual service to the young of the community was spiritual and profound. Because the meadow was flat and the dam low, it flooded quickly with the fall rains and the contribution of the brook, and the water was nowhere deeper than a boy's shoulder, save close to the dam. It was more late in summer, so the surface of the water was clear. As it was surrounded by pines, the wind seldom ruffled the calm, shallow water which froze into merely smooth black ice, sometimes as early as Thanksgiving. When the word went round that the ice would hold, all the children in town streamed to the pine woods as if the pine piper were leaving them. Their skates clanked, their shouts shrilled to the forest, and by the time the last of the procession reached the shore, there was already the ring of runners on the ice, and hockey games were organizing. Each goal consisted of two pines of overcoats, six feet apart. Hockey sticks were homemade out of hickory saplings, and the game was played with a hard rubber ball, not a flag puck. <laughs> when night came, Birch Meadow took on an air of mystery. The older children, and often their elders too, came back to it through the black, silent woods, guided by the red glimmer of a bonfire kindled on the shore, put on their skates by the firelight, and pushed out onto the ice, where the open sky glittered with stars, and the cold night wind stung your cheeks. Then it was that you skated with the sheer delight of rhythmic motion and the sensation, when the ice was clear and black, that you were gliding on the inverted sky. The ice did not go out of Birch Meadow until well into March, and in April the mill started operations, so generally it was only a month for boating. I paddled wistfully over the shallow waters, savored the smell of the cranberries, which had floated up when the ice melted, and been driven by a west wind against a bank with a barbed pink and a white scum, and gave out a pungent odor like nothing else in my memory. Birch Meadow had for us youngsters a perpetual allure. It was beautiful. We looked ever upon it with affection and delight, and its woods and waters stirred to life in us whatever capacity we had for poetic response. It was, to this time, an invaluable asset. So it came about that when the owner of the pines around Bridge Meadow offered them to the town for, as I recall, the absurdly low price, even in those days, $7,000, and a group of men who could look ahead endeavored in town meeting to persuade the voters to approach chance to save Bridge Meadow for a town park 
was lost forever. The adverse vote was overwhelming. What do we want a pot for? Such was Yankee foresight 60 years ago. Not too long thereafter, the ax was laid to the tall, brown bowls of the mines. Over the stripped, desolate land, roads began to creep. And along the road, small frame houses began to sprout like fungi. The mill was silent. The meadow was no longer flooded in the fall. And 25 or 30 years after its refusal to purchase birch meadow for $7,000, the town had to vote more than twice that sum to purchase a few acres of swampy land inside a factory, which could be partially flooded by a fire hose so that the children of the community could have a place to stay. It was not a 20th the area of Bridge Meadow. There were no woods around it, no sunset stained the cathedral windows of the pines, no cardinal flowers lifted red torches by its margin. On its cut and crowded surface was never the reflex of a star. Now, a still generation, a still later generation, is returning to the meadow, choose to be flooded, and by large scale drainage and fill, reclaiming it for the young with a school and no doubt a playground costing a million and a half. But where are the pines that once surrounded? Where are the woodlands and waterways that once led boys and girls to mystery and wonder? Where is the beauty of a natural scene which could have been preserved in the spiritual refreshment of that town in an age that needs it more and more? A million and a half dollars will build a pretty fine schoolhouse anywhere, but it cannot build a pine woods and a pond. Once we have destroyed our rich meadows, they are lost forever. And with them is lost something more precious than algebra, or even than basketball. Walter Pritchett. Mm -hmm. Reflecting 
upon the happenings during the year 2002, whether the mundane or those steeped in controversy and concern, we can take comfort in the realization that Reading is a community whose residents and employees care and will respond to its needs. We are thankful for those who quickly organized the support the troops gathering on the common, the Garden Club for continuing the very successful Adopt an Island program, and the small cadre of volunteers who have conceived and spearheaded the High School Technology Fund. It is because of the dedication of Reading citizens, employees, and elected officials that make Reading a desirable place to call home. Camille Anthony. Thank you. 